I stand here because uh, the president of the organization, uh, Dr. Khurshid Hassan, had to go for a, an urgent work to India, and he asked me uh, to run this program. And indeed, it is a privilege for me to be here because, as you know, it is a very important occasion for us. The, uh, the uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor of a legal Muslim University, Lieutenant General Zamiruddin Shah, is here and it is an honor for uh, every alumni that we are able to have him with us and uh, he is here with Mrs. Shah and this is all the more an honor for us and uh, I will uh, uh, I, we are running slightly uh, behind schedule so I will not waste any more time I will uh, like to ask uh, our Vice President, uh, Dr. Akhtar Siddiqui, to please come. We will start our program uh, as we start traditionally uh, at Aligarh by Tilawat e Kalam Park. And so, she, please, uh, Dr. Uh, Akhtar Siddiqui Sahiba, could you please come to the mic and recite a few lines from <laughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنا أنت عليهم غير المقدوب عليكم ولا الدوالين آمين Thank you very much, Akhtar Apa. Uh, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, this program is being organized by the collaboration of Aligarh Muslim University Alumni Association and Queen Mary University of London, um, uh, and I'm very grateful to Dr. Ahmed Vaseem, who has uh, supported uh, us in organizing this program. And I also thank uh, Professor Mike Curtis, the Dean of Dentistry, who's present among us. Thank you, sir, for coming. I now request uh, our secretary, uh, Mr. Firoz Uddin Mirza, to please come to the mic and formally welcome the audience. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum. It is indeed a proud moment for the AMU Alumni Association <coughs> UK, the Sir Sayyid Foundation London, founded by Dr. Farid, and all of you who have come here at the Perrin Lecture Theatre at Queen Mary University. We have with us our guests of honor, Mrs. and Janab Lieutenant General Samiruddin Shah. Mr. Shah, as we know him most by way of being the current Vice Chancellor of our alma mater, the world famous Aligarh Muslim University, Uttar Pradesh in India. 
respected elders ladies and gentlemen i request all of you to join me in extending a sincere and heartwarming welcome to our esteemed and much loved guests of honor this evening please welcome with thunderous clapping mrs and janab shah please <laughs> Here are a few quick extracts from the vision when I was going through the uh, official university website to see because I, I don't know him much personally to see what his vision is and I quote few things from there. <coughs> I picked up two things from his vision. A, he says his objective is to propel AMU to the position of the topmost university of the country. We welcome that. We appreciate that. and we are looking forward for that another part says total integrity will be my priority and it is non negotiable we sir we very much appreciate that we want to proclaim today that we will take these words with us and trust you because i know that uh, i know what these words mean when they come from a person who had been at the top echelons of the uh, armed forces i had a glimpse of their integrity and discipline during my ncc days when in the army attachment camp before earning my b certificate so respected vice chancellor we are very hopeful with you at these helms We are hopeful that under his stewardship the university will improve by leaps and bounds in educationally and also in terms of fruitfulness for those who come to seek knowledge there. He also exhibited that he cares for the students but also values everyone connected with AMU. And the evidence is he being here despite most of the alumni not being here today. we are happy and thankful that he did not forget even those bulbuls who once sang in the gardens of the alma mater and despite being overseas preserved those twitters forever i once again on behalf of amu alumni association uk and sir sir foundation london welcome mrs and mr shah this evening thank you very much and jazakallah Thank you, Feroz. Uh, <coughs> Aligarh Muslim University, which is one of the prime universities of India, was founded by an extraordinary man called Sir Syed Ahmed Khan. In the next few minutes, I will be talking about this extraordinary man and about his mission. <coughs> that will set the scene for further lectures which will be delivered by ahmed wasim sahib and our honorable vice chancellor mat sahil hame jano phirta hai falak barson tab khaak ke parde se insaan nikalte hain after the time has been in search for hundreds of years it finds a glowing human face revealing itself out of the curtains of darkness and dust <coughs> sir sayed ahmed khan one of the architects of modern india was an important figure of the 19th century what i want to do in the next few moments is to tell you who was sir sayed what led to the creation of amu what is aligarh movement and what does sir sayed's movement mean for us in the 21st century uh, sir sayed has often been described as an indian educator and politician islamic reformer and modernist founder of the aligarh muslim university as Aligarh Muslim University, and more importantly, as the founder of the Aligarh movement. <coughs> so.
So what is a legal movement? If you go through the pages of history, you will find that the key elements of this movement were to protect Islam against the onslaught of fundamentalists, to remove the bitter enmity which had arisen between the Muslims and the British and to establish friendly relations between them, to reinterpret the teaching of Islam and bring them in harmony with modern science and philosophy so that Muslims while holding on to their religion might take a rational and enlightened view of life and meet the demands of the new age. To persuade Muslims to learn the English language and Western sciences. To maintain Urdu as an associate official language and to develop it through translations and original writings. We will talk about the movement a bit later. Let us first talk a little bit about Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan's background. He was born in Delhi, probably on 17th of October, 1817, during the reign of Akbar Shah II. His father was Sayyid Muttaqi and his mother was Azizun Nisa, daughter of Khaja Fariduddin Ahmad. Sayyid Muttaqi was an officer in the Mughal courts and was in the good books of the emperor. While Farid Uddin Ahmad, a scholar of Kashmiri descent, had good connections with the East India Company. So through his maternal and paternal links, Sir Sayyid had the opportunity to closely observe two powers. One that was falling down and the other that was setting its feet on Indian soil. He had his early education in accordance with the traditions of Mughal nobility in Delhi. As a young man, he participated in a number of sports. He used to move around with light-hearted, jovial friends and enjoyed having parties and attending music and dance performances that were held at Mughal courts. He was awarded prestigious titles by the emperor. He learned and practiced medicine for some time, but then joined courts in UP and was later promoted to the post of Munsif, which is actually a judge in a court in India. <laughs> he was quite particular about etiquette and was always elegantly dressed and impeccably behaved. He was a man with a traditional background but modern outlook. His friend Graham describes him as being of middle height, massive build, big, ha having big beard and a hearty laugh. And there are stories about his beard. He had a big beard because one, one that was the fashion of the time. But also we are told that he had a big goiter and his big beard will hide that goiter. He was a man of letters as well as a man of action. <clears throat> his first publication, Jame Jam, which was in Persian, uh, uh, came out in 1840. Asara Sanadid, which is a study of Delhi's monuments, came a late, bit later and brought him some popularity. In 1855, he published his edition of Abul Fazal's Aine Akbari. There is an interesting <coughs> story about Sir Sayyid's Aine Akbari. Sir Sayyid sent his Aine Akbari to Ghalib for comments and for writing a taqriz, which means a laudatory foreword to the book. <coughs> and this intellectual and scholar, Ghalib, though a product of Mughal culture himself, could foresee the imminent Europe-sponsored change in world polity. Ghalib wrote a poetic foreword for this new edition of Aini Akbari, but it was not the type Sayyid Ahmad might have expected. Ghalib commented, the book had a value only as an antique document. He advised Sayyid Ahmad not to waste his talent in ruminating the past, but to look to the future. Ghalib's original taqriz in Persian has been translated into English by renowned Urdu scholar Shamsur Rahman Farooqi 
and into Urdu by Dr. Khurshid Rizvi. And both translations are worth reading and they are available on Wikipedia. At least the English one is available on Wikipedia. Some of its parts are particularly interesting. I will not go into too much of detail about this, but I would like you to just see what is on this slide on the last uh, page, the last uh, stanza. Go to London, he says, for in that shining garden, the city is bright in the night without candles. It is possible that Ghalib's view only indicates the prevalent line of thinking among enlightened Muslims of the time. But it is not unreasonable to assume that the advice of this intellectual giant made Sir Sayyid reflect upon the choices he had and help him decide the direction of his future travel. In 1857, there was massacre in India. Sayyid Ahmed's book, Azbab e Bagawat e Hind, gave a fair account of the faults committed by British officers and proposed solutions to bridge the widening gap between the new rulers and the natives. From 1859 to 1868, he was engaged in a number of activities aimed at public education and social welfare. And it was during this time, in 1864, he founded the Scientific Society with his friend, Raja Jaikishan Das. And the society translated more than 40 books on electricity, meteorology, agriculture, and other subjects. <coughs> During this period, he not only set up schools and educational societies, but also wrote books, articles and commentaries, and founded a hospital. He also wrote a, a commentary on Bible, and this perhaps is the first commentary on the Bible written by a Muslim. In 1868, he was making plans to go to England and order, in order to gain first-hand knowledge of the English education system. He came to England in 1869. He was awarded Order of the Star of India. He stayed here 17 months, visited schools at Harrow and Eton, University of Cambridge, University of Oxford. Here he freely mixed with people of all strata. He joined clubs attended functions, and saw almost every aspect of British life. He went back to India with a determination to establish an institute on the model of Oxford and Cambridge. Within months of return from England, he started the journal tehzeeb ul -Ikhlaq. First issue was brought out on 24th of December, 1870. Two days later, a committee was set up to launch MAO College, Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College. The launching of Tehzeeb ul Ikhlaq marks the dawn of an era not only in Urdu journalism but also in Indian Islamic thought. <coughs> in this journal, through this journal, he challenged slavery and bonded labor, he spoke of women's rights, argued in favor of interest in government loans criticized taqlid, which means blind adherence, and advanced and advocated ijtihad, which means reinterpretation of relig religious concepts according to the needs of time. Through the journal, Sir Sayyid came out in the open with his modern and revolutionary ideas, writing boldly on controversial issues. He confronted the obscurantist head-on. He was called Kristan, Mulhid, Kafir, but he did not stop. Ideas emanating from Tehzeeb ul Akhlaq spread like fire, burning the dead wood of stale conservatism and illuminating the way towards modernization and development. In 1877, the foundation stone of MAO College was laid down and his hard work continued. 
In 1880, a controversial but modernist commentary on the Quran came out. After the opening of MEO College, he was nominated to Imperial Legislative Council. And when I was going all through these papers, it was very interesting for me to find that he initiated a bill in favor of compulsory vaccination against a smallpox while as a member of this council. Sir Sayyid's commentary on the Quran shows that he recognized the limitation of language in, in interpreting religious concepts. He did not believe in miracles and felt that they were indicative of the metaphorical and allegorical nature of the text. Sir Sayyid's MAO college was a planned community enlightened by a galaxy of intellectuals of the time, like Theodor Beck, Altaf Hussain Hali, Zakaullah, T.W. Arnold, Nazir Ahmed, Shibli Nomani. Free discussions and debates on moral and philosophical issues were encouraged on the college campus. The aim was not just to impart education, but also to inspire creativity and to keep the students' inner spirit alive. On 27th of March, 1898, Sir Sayyid's exceptional life came to an end. He was buried in what was then the MAO College Mosque. He left behind a college that became a university and a movement that transcends geographical and temporal boundaries. <clears throat> Let us remind ourselves of some of his memorable quotes. I won't read all of them, but some important ones. The student will soon discover that truth is many-sided and the world is good deal wider than his own sect or society or clan. India is a beautiful bride and Hindus and Muslims are her two eyes. If one of them is lost, the bride will lose its beauty. It, was, it is my dream that Indian Muslims of tomorrow has philosophy in his right hand, natural science in his left, and crowns his head the Kalima. O Hindus and Muslims, do you not both live here and are you not buried in this land or cremated in the hearts of this land? Remember that Hindu and Muslims are words of religious significance only. Otherwise, Hindus, Muslims, and Christians who live in this country constitute one nation. His work gave rise to a new and liberal thinking about among Muslims, which led to the emergence of a new generation of Muslim intellectuals and politicians who applied logic and reasoning in religious interpretations. One of them who was inspired by Sir Sayyid was Allama Iqbal, and he says about uh, religious interpretations, the claim of the present generation Muslim liberals to reinterpret the foundational legal principles in the light of their own experience and the altered conditions of modern life is, in my opinion, perfectly justified. The teaching of the Quran that life is a process of progressive creation necessitates that each generation, guided but unhampered by the work of its predecessors, should be permitted to solve its own problems. Another one who was inspired by Sir Sayyid was Molana Abul Kalam Azad. If religion expresses a universal truth, why should there be such differences and conflicts between men professing different religions? Why should one religion claim to be the sole repository of truth and condemn all others as false? In 1920, many years after his death, Sir Sayyid, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan's dream came true. By an act of the Indian Parliament, MAO College became a legal Muslim university. And just look at the firsts of a legal. Now, how inclusive can a university be? The first principal of the MAO College was Theodore Beck, a Christian. The first graduate was Ishwari Prasad, a Hindu. The first chancellor of the illegal Muslim University was Sultan Jaha Begum, a woman. During the 19th and early 20th century, the period when the foundation of MAO College was and AMU was being laid, many changes were taking place in the world. One of them was the increasing popularity in the West of the concept of secularism. The Oxford English Dictionary defines secularism as the view that religious considerations should be deliberately omitted from temporal affairs. 
or the view that education, especially that which is publicly funded, should not promote religious belief or include religious instructions. However, in India, the term secularism acquired a slightly different meaning. Indian secularism implies freedom of conscience and free profession, practice and propagation of religion. And according to a prominent jurist, the basic philosophy of Indian secularism is consistent with the age-old Indian belief that truth is one, but it has many facets and wise men describe truth differently. MAO College and the University at Aligarh developed and blossomed in the light of Indian secularism. New buildings were erected. Auditoriums and libraries were built. New colleges and faculties were established. New gardens were laid and old monu monuments were restored. Over the years, Aligarh as a center of education and learning has produced many eminent men and women in the fields of education, science and politics, fine arts and sports. And this is the university today. It runs 325 courses, has more than 95 departments, 12 faculties, more than 2,000 faculty members, and about 30,000 students. I will just give you some examples of figures who have kept Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan's torch burning. Hasrat Mohani, Sheikh Abdullah, who actually started women's education at the uh, um, Aligarh University. Sir Ziauddin Rafi Ahmad Qidwai, Dr. Zakir Hussain, the President of India. Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, Frontier Gandhi, Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah, Sheikh Kashmir, and Heads of State, Liaqat Ali, Ayyub Khan, Poet, Asrar al Hakmajas, Sadat Hasan Manto, story writer, film personalities, Begum Para, Renuka Devi, one of the earliest, uh, you know, lady actors, uh, <coughs> sports person, Ghos Muhammad, tennis, Lala Amarnath, cricket, Zafar Iqbal, hockey, Talat Mahmood, Rahima Sumrazat, uh, Mushtaq Ahmad Yusufi, the greatest Urdu humorist, Ali Sardar Jafri, Ismat Chuktai, Irfan Habib, Zahur Qasim, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor knows this face, Nasiruddin Shah, uh, Shahriyar, and the President Vice President, present Vice President of India, S. Hamid Ansari Saab. So, today, students of AMU are spread all over the world. Just as Sir Sayyid prophesied, when the foundation stone of MAO College was being laid down. He said, and I quote, this small plant one day will turn into a mighty tree whose branches will spread all over the world. Sons and daughters of Sir Sayyid Aligarh live and work as productive and successful members of multicultural societies all over the world. Living with others comes naturally to them because that is what Aligarh has taught them. But the 21st century has brought with it some new challenges. Terrorism, war, environmental issues, world poverty, discrimination, and new diseases. How can these problems be solved? They cannot be solved in isolation. Societies and communities working in isolation. They certainly cannot be solved by the rhetoric of clash of civilizations. They can be solved, however, by opening the doors of knowledge and by collaboration in all fields of knowledge, arts, science, culture, religious studies. And this was the approach which Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan took in the 19th century. And this is the approach that is needed in the 21st century. This is the approach that can make a better and a happier world for all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
Right, so uh, I'll call upon uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Vaseem to please come and uh, tell us his vision about for AMU. Uh, uh, most of us know him. He is uh, he has been uh, the spirit behind this program, and uh, he is an uh, associate professor uh, in oral biology at uh, this university, um, Queen Mary University of London. Uh, well done. Good evening, um, the Honorable Vice-Chancellor of Aligarh Muslim University, Mr. Samiruddin Shah, Mrs. Shah, um, my colleague, um, Dr. Curtis, and AMU alumni. First, I want to thank Dr. Halal Farid for including my name in the list of his speakers at this reception. Now, this is the first time I'm speaking in front of AMU alumni as well as uh, our vice chancellor. Um, so when Hilal asked me to, to speak at this reception, um, I, had to, I, I took my own time to come up um, with this topic, my vision for AMU. <coughs> now, some of you might wonder, how much do I know the present day AMU, to have a vision about it. A lot is my answer. I would like to say a few words about me. <coughs> I did my PhD from Aligarh with one of the best known biochemists that Aligarh has produced, um, Professor Ahmed Salahuddin. He was the man who established biotechnology um, at AMU, the most successful research unit uh, at the moment at AMU. Although I physically left AMU a long time ago, but mentally I never left it, which is the case with most of AMU alumni. Every time I visit Aligarh, I spend hours uh, <coughs> talking to students and staff, giving lectures about my own research, giving lectures to undergraduate and postgraduate students. And the other day, I was looking at some web pages from AMU, and I found my name in the Department of Biochemistry, and I would just would like to show that. <laughs> so this is Department of Biochemistry from a Jain Medical College, notable alumni of the department, and you can see my name. And then the two more places I could see, this is Department of Biochemistry from Life Sciences, and you can see my name. I found that at another place as well, which is notable alumni of this biochemistry department in life sciences, and that you can see Ahmed was seen with Queen Mary University of London. So what I'm trying to say is that I have been very closely associated with that institution. I have got a picture here you can see. This was taken soon after I gave a lecture. Here I am. And this is uh, <coughs> Professor Salimuddin, ex-Vice Chancellor of AMU. This is uh, Vice this, is, this is the principal of dental college and it's the principal of medical college over there. So from that, you can see that I'm perhaps the most appropriate person <coughs> to have a vision about AMU. Now, as we all know, AMU is a multi-faculty institution. But I'm not going to talk about art and you know, cult uh, culture and dance, because I'm not really um, in that field. I'm a scientist, so I'm going to science, I'm going to talk about science, medicine, dentistry, engineering, biotechnology. That is something I know well. And I'm going to focus on two aspects. 
as a part of my vision. What AMU has got it and what it should have it, what it needs. So first is what it has got it. Let's see, and the first I want to talk about infrastructure. So AMU has excellent infrastructure for medical, dental, engineering, life sciences, physical sciences. The research laboratories are exceptionally um, uh, built and they are maintained by the university. The university always prided herself in having a state of art computing facilities. In the 70s, when I was a student, I remember I used to get mark sheet, computerized mark sheet, which was very rare at that time um, in India. The university has kept up the pace with IT innovation and development, which is certainly commendable. The library facilities are excellent. Malona Azad Library is considered to be one of the best in the country. And the most important thing which I want to uh, tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is the hall of, hall of res halls of residence. That is really very unique among all in most of the Indian universities. And they provide excellent environment for, for growth and learning. The next item on my agenda is teaching. Now, as you know, I have been, um, I have been teaching in this country for almost um, 22 years. I taught in, in, at King's College London. I have been teaching here. In terms of research, I have experience at both sides of Atlantic, in US and in this country. And having spent a lot of time at AMU after I left that place, I can <coughs> say that the standard of teaching is very high. Excellent teaching quality that you can see all around. I was impressed to see students so good at mental math. And most of them come from English medium, so it's very easy to communicate. Now, AMU has recently introduced a feedback system, which is the same which we introduce, which we have in this country, where the students are asked to, to, to provide feedback about the quality of teaching by the staff, by the teaching institute. That's really great. I was so impressed to see that. And the other thing which I would like to say, which is the student feedback system. And the last item is that the postgraduate program at AMU has introduced research project that was not there when I was a student at that place. It's a very good development. Yes, Absolutely. definitely. Now, the other thing I want to say is about staff development. That is something very, very, is very taken very seriously by AMU. Staff development is so important that if you do not have staff development courses, there are specific courses that you are asked to attend. And if you don't attend that, those courses, you cannot apply for promotion. And it's absolutely brilliant that they have started that doing that. So that's, that is uh, uh, very, very important, and we should all appreciate that. The most important thing I want to talk about is research. Okay? Now, when it comes to research, AMU has done really well. And I want to talk about two individuals because I know them very well. Um, one of them is Professor uh, Ahmed Salahuddin, who uh, I did my PhD with. And here, um, he was he's a renowned biochemist, the only AMU biochemist to have two PhDs. He did one from AMU and the other from Duke University, USA. And the only AMU alumnus I know to have published a paper in Nature from the work which he did at AMU. Okay? It's not that he did, he, he, the work was done at, at, at US. He published paper in Journal of Biological Chemistry, Biochemistry, Biochemical Journal, BBA, the same kind of publication we would like to publish or we publish here in this country or in US or in the West in general. And he was the one who established the biotechnology unit at AMU. 
The other person I want to talk about, he was a, my teacher and a, a mentor, is Professor Majid Siddiqui. He used to work on col cholesterol metabolism. And here, a statement I found on the internet. This is a um, patent that he published, um, that he published, uh, and he was <coughs> granted that. Okay? So a major discovery by Dr. Siddiqui entitled Process of Combating Hypercholesterolemia resulted in a U.S. patent number 3629449. This groundbreaking research conducted by Dr. Siddiqui at AMU provided evidence for the first time that cholesterol biosynthesis inhibitors such as 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutaric acid might find a therapeutic use in treatment of hyperlipidemia which is increased lipid cholesterol. The global exploitation and marketing rights for this study was taken up by MS Biochem Behring Corporation, San Diego, USA. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the enzyme, which is HMG-CoA reductase. This is the enzyme which is targeted by a very important drug called statin. Of course, the mechanism of action of statin is not the feedback inhibition, but instead it is a competitive inhibition. So it's a little bit different, but the enzyme is the same. Now, that was the past, okay? And I don't want to talk about more about the past. We, we, it's all excellent. No problem with that. But what about the present and the future? That's what we should, we should think about. Um, when you talk about um, future, in my view, future of research in AMU is really good. But the question is, how can we make it great? How can we make AMU research the top only, in the, not only in the country, but in the world? And if you want to address that question, you need to look at what AMU needs. That is the key. What does it need? Okay. By the way, it doesn't, I, in my view, it doesn't need a golf course. It doesn't need a very big gym. Okay. It, it's nice to have a golf course, it's nice to have a gym, okay? but that is not which is going to improve the quality of research in my view. That is not what we want. Now, having spent a lot of time with AMU researchers over the last about 20 years, I can identify three things, ladies and gentlemen, three things which would make a huge impact, not only for research in the country, but will make AMU one of the best in the world. So what are those things? One thing, the top on the list <laughs> is power, power and power, okay? India is known for a chronic power shortage and Aligarh is no exception. AMU needs, AMU needs desperately a uninterrupted supply of power. But that would take 10 years. Can I just? Yes. Can I say something? Please do not interrupt the speaker. Let the speaker speak. There might be an, a chance to ask questions okay. later on. Please, that disturbs everybody. Thank you. We need the AMU. One thing which is very important, it needs uninterrupted supply of power. I must say that the situation, power situation, has improved tremendously to that what it was when I was a student. We used to have power cut for six hours, sometimes overnight. I remember I used to come in the middle of night to do my experiment because during the day there was no power supply. And it was not in Aligarh, it was all over the country. So what is the solution? That there is something which I have been saying for a very long time to my colleagues in US, Canada, in this country, in India, and in throughout the Middle East because I, am, I have a very, very big uh, network of people all over the world, is to have that the AMU should have its own power plant. AMU should have its own power plant. And I'm delighted, I'm absolutely delighted to have the present administration is taking that uh, uh, idea forward. And there <coughs> is a plan to have a, uh, the, for the AMU to have its own power plant. It will take time. Of course it will take time, things do take time, especially in a country like India. But the, 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 um, the, the thing, the, the, the role has, the, 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 um, it has already started 
in terms of discussion with people and in, with the staff members. Then the second thing I need, which is extremely difficult, I know in a, in a, at a place like Aligarh, okay, but it can be done. Management of research, very, very important. It's controversial, especially in uh, AMU. It is complex, and it has a it has lot of meaning. It will have different meaning for different people. But I have my own meaning, and I want to explain to that. It's part of my vision. What I would like to see, that every faculty in AMU to have a research committee, and that should be and that should decide the research strategy for that faculty. And that research strategy should last for five years. After that, it should be revised. Every faculty appointment, whether it is a guest or otherwise, should fit to research strategy. And there should be role for AMU alumni in that research committee. And I mean qualified research, uh, qualified AMU alumni. And when you talk of science and research, I can give you two examples right away. Dr. Shahid Jamil, most of you must have heard his name. He is the CEO of India Alliance, an 80 million partnership between the Wellcome Trust and Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. And he is just round the corner, 125 miles away from Aligarh. I'm sure he will be more than happy to be part of any research committee that you create in AMU. And I can give you another name, Dr. C. D. Rao. He is the associate professor in virology at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Now, if you when you talk of science in India, the first name has got to be IISC, Indian Institute of Science. That because that was established by the Raj and was one of the best, in, the best in the country, I should say, and one of the best in the world. The last item on my list is a constant breath of fresh air. That's what we need. But when I talk of fresh air, it is not the polluted air from across the Katpula. We don't need that. We don't need that air, okay? Uh, AM, and what I mean by that, what I mean, that people should go out and interact. What is going on outside Aligarh? Uh, that's really, really important. Now, at the moment, AMU Biochemistry and Biotechnology has established very good collaboration with two institutions that I know of, and they are probably the only one, one is AMU, University of Wisconsin Exchange Program, whereby they also call it Summer Training Program, whereby, whereby five PhD students from AMU, they go to University of Wisconsin for two months. And that is funded by Corona Scholarship. When the student fail to, Corona, to qualify in Corona Scholarship, then they are funded by AMU Alumni Association USA. Unfortunately, we haven't got it, but we that's where AMU alumni need to work towards that. There is another one, it's called AMU Ohio State University Exchange Program, whereby four PhD students, their supervisors, four PhD supervisors obviously, and four teachers, they spend two weeks in different laboratories in Ohio, in, in Ohio State University. This is funded by Obama Singh Initiative, where government of India and US has contributed $5 million each. And this is managed by United States India Education Foundation. So, and this is, this is called STEM year program. And uh, STEM is uh, uh, science, uh, um, um, technology, engineering, and math. And ER stands for education and research program. Also has provision for University of uh, Ohio State University staff to visit QM for a maximum of three months. And I believe it has been passed and approved by Academic Council and is yet to be implemented. Okay, I hope it will be implemented soon. The e STEM ER program is going to be expanded. Okay, it's going to be expanded. And we hope that's going to include other um, institutions. 
Now, at present, there is no partnership between AMU and any UK EN university. We are planning to change that. AMU, we want AMU to establish a partnership with QMUL, and that is a possibility. People will ask, why QM? Well, it is a multi-faculty institution, okay? It has a uh, dental school, you know, um, uh, and unlike uh, UCL or Imperial, okay, the only other institution which is King's has a uh, dentistry. So it's a multi-faculty institution just like AMU. Um, it is located in East London, where there is a very large Asian population, and it helps if you are doing a research project where because the genetic makeup is going to be similar and you can be able to in a position to compare data much easily, especially if, they are, if the project involves epidemiology type project. Then the other reason is that QM is definitely the, one of the best institutions in the UK. Okay? And that I'm not saying it, there are facts about it. I am going to present those facts. And I want you to take it from me and, 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 and spread those, 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 those things um, in the community and across. Okay? Now, in this country, there is a group of universities it's called Russell Group University. This is like an Ivy League. Okay? These are elite institutions you know, in the country. And there are 24 of them. Until 2011, QM was not part of um, Russell Group of Universities. But in 2012, it all changed, and QM was invited to be part of Russell Group University. And that reflects the quality of education and research that we deliver at QM. So, so what is the plan for AMU-QM partnership, okay? Um, well, we want to establish a link whereby students and researchers at each institution should know about the other. Um, an AMU alumnus based in Middle East asked me the other day, how many students are going from QM and how many are coming from AMU? My answer was simple. Nobody is going from QM and nobody is coming from AMU. We just want to establish a link, a friendship, and see where does it take, you, take us. Ladies and gentlemen, we are, glowing, we, are, we are planning to go out together. We are not dating yet. I must make one thing very clear. This link, if we establish, is not about money. It's not about money. It's not about cheap labor. It's not about establishing East India Company. What we want to do, our goal is to identify our respective strengths and work together for the betterment of science and mankind, which is the dream, which was the dream of Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. Now, before I finish, I would like to thank certain individuals who have really helped me to set up this, this, uh, this meeting together. So, Harriet House from International Office, she has been really supportive of a lot. Professor Mike Curtis, Dean of Dentistry, He's the most powerful person in the School of Medicine and Dentistry. He's the Dean of Dentistry, and generally in this, in, in this country, deans or Dean of Dentistry is generally considered to be the most powerful person. He has been very, very supportive of that. It's only because of him that we were able to, 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 to arrange this meeting. Professor Ian McKenzie, he had to go early. He's the um, head of oral cancer group, and our collaborator as well, Professor Graham Hitman. He is uh, um, the in, uh, institute director of, the, of Blizzard. Uh, Tracy Hamilton, 
Um, she is she the our secretary of uh, CDOS and other QM staff member who, who have helped us. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, the time for which all of you have been waiting has now come. And I have the privilege to invite the Honorable Vice-Chancellor of Aligarh Muslim University to come to the podium and talk to you. As he comes, let me tell you a few things about his exceptional journey. Lieutenant General Shah's family comes from the Sardana town of Meret district in Uttar Pradesh. He is an alumnus of the prestigious St. Joseph's College, Nainital. He attended the National Defense Academy at Khadakwasla, Pune. He took part in the Battle of Longewala in the War of 1971. He is also, and I cannot not mention it, he is also the elder brother of one of India's most famous and most successful film personalities, the noted actor Nasiruddin Shah, who, in an article, has this to say about his elder brother, and I quote, I figured that if I focused in the same way on my acting, I could make a serious career of it too. His being a good soldier inspired me to be a good actor. I unquote. Mr. Zamiruddin Shah holds a Master of Science degree in Defense Sciences from the University of Madras and a Master of Philosophy degree from the University of Indore. Lieutenant General Zamiruddin Shah retired as a senior officer of the Indian Army. He last served as the Deputy Chief of Army Staff, Indian Army. And now, as you know, he has on his shoulders the challenging responsibility of being the Vice Chancellor of Aligarh Muslim University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General Zamiruddin Shah Sahib. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to all of you. Mr. Hilal Farid former president of AMU Alumni Association, UK, Dr. Afsar Siddiqui Sahiba, Mr. Firozuddin, Secretary, Dr. Wasim, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> it is a great honor for me to be standing before the alumni of Aligarh Muslim University. Let me tell you that every time I meet alumni, I get a surge, I get empowered, I feel that we've got to do something for this great university of ours. My entire family was educated at Aligarh. I joined the army when I was 15, so I didn't get the benefit of being a student of Aligarh Muslim University, but I did get a chance to serve it as the Vice Chancellor. So I have both advantages, family association, but no baggage. I am carrying no baggage. So I came with fresh thoughts, a fresh mind to do something for the university, to which I was emotionally very, very attached. Let me tell you that Your very presence here indicates your love and affection for your alma mater. Let me also tell you that I have a team which is 
totally inspired and it draws inspiration from all of you. We have a committed team, totally. We may have different ways of functioning than normal like admissions, but we are committed, we have a goal in mind, and we are going to achieve it, inshallah. I have no doubts about it. We have given out a vision statement 2020. If you go to the AMU net, you will read it. My vision statement. It says quite clearly, without any ambiguity, we aim to become India's number one university by 2017. That is Sir Sayed's 200th birth anniversary. <laughs> we, will get, we will get a louder clap when I tell you that, inshallah, by 2020, that's when we AMU completes 100 years, we will be the first university of the country to figure amongst the top 200 universities of the world. At the moment, there are no Indian universities. I am sorry to admit, but inshallah, AMU will be the first one. I would also like to tell you that Times Higher Education UK graded AMU as the third best university of the country. <laughs> the top two universities have only a very limited time to remain ahead of us. We are going to displace them and pretty soon. <laughs> we have steadily climbed up the ladder. I think at the time when you were students, AMU was the topmost university of the country. Unfortunately, over a period of time, we had student disorders, closure of the universities, sign dies, and other unfortunate developments which retarded the growth of the university. I am very, very proud to say that for two and a half years, there has been no closures at all. There has been unhindered academic activity, of which I will cover later. And we have made all round progress. I would also like to tell you that the university authorities never made an attempt to contact the alumni. Or if they did, it was always a very feeble attempt. But my concept is different. I am going to follow what the Americans are doing. We are going to draw on the three T's. We call them the tangos in the army. Three T's which we want from our alumni your time, your talent, and your treasures. You got your treasures because of AMU. And it is now payback time. So we're going to ask you for your three Ts, your time, your talent, and your treasures. Can be a small amount, a nug nugget or two, but they'll be good enough. We were so far behind American universities. I went to Stanford and I realized, my God, we are 100 years behind. We are still in the chalk and blackboard stage. So I appealed to the American alumni to give us 100 smart classrooms. They asked me, why 100? I said, we, we need one for each department. They have come forward. We've already got 33 smart classrooms in place. The American alumni are helping us. They asked me how much it costs, and I said 10 lakhs per smart classroom. Because what the departments are giving us are old, dilapidated classrooms which are almost crumbling. They know that the vice chancellor is going to do something about it, so they give me the worst classroom, but we said it doesn't matter. Give us a classroom and we'll do it up for you. And we are slowly doing it. By 2017, inshallah, we'll have 100 smart classrooms in place. When you visit AMU next, you will see a 
clean, efficient AMUs, wide roads, tree-lined. You will find our old historical buildings redone, refurbished, restored. I visited, I spent five days in Oxford, and what I saw was amazing. 500-year-old buildings, totally, they're looking almost new. I mean, brand new, everything in place. What it was 500 years ago, still the same. We need to do that for AMU. Our buildings are 100 years old. They need refurbishment. They need restoration. And that is something I'm going to ask the UK alumni. What we need to do first is restore the Grand Mosque, the Jama Masjid. We need to restore it. I sent a teacher to Oxford. He spent five months courtesy Professor Farhan Nizami and learned the art of restoration. He is back. He has given me an assessment. <coughs> says it will cost one crore to restore the university to its pristine glory. The, the, the Grand Mosque, the Jama Masjid. Ah, Sir Sayyid was a great archaeologist himself. And our historians have done a great job in unearthing India's treasures. But what was it? Where were these treasures? They were lying in gunny sacks in a building which was crumbling. So I closed shop. We are establishing a world-class museum at Kennedy Hall. You'll be happy to see it when you come. It's going to be world-class, I assure you. And I again appealed to the American alumni, and they got us a grant of $100,000 from a person who's not an alum, alum of AMU, but we invited him over to the university, and he gave us a grant with which we are making the, which is going to be the best university museum, I assure you that. <clears throat> the Molana Azad Library has been extended. The pressures <laughs> of large numbers, 30,000 almost students, are enormous. And now the women's college is trying to get access to the university. I have denied them that privilege for two reasons. One is the university can't take any more students. I mean, they are packed. And secondly, if the girls start coming in, it'll be four times more attendance, whether they're for study or other, or bird watching. But what we have done is extended the facility online to all the girls. This is the women's college, 4,000 of them. They can demand a book online. Next day it is delivered. And we have also strengthened the Women's College Library. But ultimately, the aim is to, to give them an opportunity. Once we expand the library more, we'll see whether we need to change things. <coughs> We've got new blocks for social science, <coughs> engineering college, Tibia College. Tibia College. We are going to be competitors to Hamdard. Hamdard is making a fortune. But our Tibia College Dawakhana was in a small premises. And when I asked them, why aren't we expanding? They said, we don't have the space. But I went, when I went through the accounts, I found they had 20 crores locked away in fixed deposits. I says, this money is lying idle. We are making a brand new factory. And inshallah, we are going to beat Hamdard. There's such a huge market for Yunani medicine. People have come from the United States. They told me, General, whatever you produce, we'll take. So we're going to do that. Our sports facilities are almost the best in the country. But what we need is a new swimming pool. We got the grant from Yusuf Ali. Again, 
non alum alum of AMU, he gave us five crores to open not only a swimming pool, he says a sports complex. He is the leading, well, he's got hundreds of malls all over the world. Yusuf Ali, you must have heard, Lulu. Anyway, he came and visited the university and we, I announced that he's given us five crores. The check was already in my pocket. He got up to the podium and said, I'm giving you five crores more for the women's college. Make a swimming pool for them also. Make them a sports complex. Why I'm talking of swimming is that we want our students to be fearless. If they don't know swimming, they'll always have a fear of water. They'll have fear of everything. We want to change them into men and women of guts and standing. And so my first priority is swimming. When you visit AMU, you'll be housed in a very comfortable guest house. I assure you that. The guest houses in AMU look like army messes. They may not be as efficiently run, but they have all the comforts. They have Wi-Fi connected, there's a geezer, there's clean linen, clean bed sheets, clean everything. One of the problems which we were facing was lack of hostel facilities. In a university which was meant to house 7,000, we have accommodated to 28,000. I don't blame my predecessors. They wanted to give opportunities for education to as many students as possible. But we did lack Girls were coming, living outside in the city. We are constructing a hall of residence for 1,500 girls. That will enable us to house all the girls on the campus. <coughs> they won't have to travel by rickshaws and everything, everything else. They'll be living on the campus. We are opening a hostel for NRI and international students. Uh, the students, we had thousands of foreign students when you were there. The figure has dropped basically because we couldn't house them adequately. So we are making an international hostel for those students also. The Kennedy Hall is being refurbished. It had leakage in the roofs. The revolving stage was not functioning. We are doing all that. We are repairing it. There will be refurbished auditoriums at the Polytechnic and at Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College. These were necessary and we are doing it. Academics. <clears throat> I've already told you about unhindered ac academic activity. We have reviewed the curriculum. We want to make our students job ready. We've interacted with the industry and asked them, what do you want? And we've changed the syllabi accordingly. We don't want our students to go and then get six months more training before they, get, before they learn their job. We want them to be job ready. <coughs> we've already made an innovation and research council. This year, we gave awards to three professors who had the maximum number of inventions and innovations. And I'll tell you more about it later. So we are not neglecting it. We've appointed a committee for academic progression and university rankings. We want to make AMU a brand name. We want it like St. Stephen's of Delhi, so that the companies come flocking to us and our students don't have to go begging for jobs. And we should be in such a position that we say, no more. No more visits, please. Our students have already been absorbed. That's what a brand name will bring to us when we become number one university, inshallah. <clears throat> we are in the process of formulating the Faculty of International Studies, where we are going to teach Chinese, Hebrew, French, and Spanish. <clears throat> STEM and other things has already been talked about. We are encouraging our students and faculty to go out, see what the universities of the world are teaching. Come out from the, don't be a frog in the well. 
The only problem is finances. Our students cannot afford the exchange programs. They expect the university to do it, but we don't have adequate funds. So what I propose, and I propose to the American universities, let's have an exchange program. All your student has to do is bear the expenses of traveling up to AMU. We'll receive him at Delhi. After that, he is our responsibility. Not a pound, not a dollar will be charged. We'll take care of the food, the lodging, the education, everything, transport. And I said, you do the same for our students. They'll land up in America or England. After that, we leave the responsibility to you. Is that acceptable or not? You'll have to examine it. But that is the only way I find which is feasible for our students to the exchange, student exchange program. The faculty, faculty will look after themselves. But the student exchange programs, I repeat, cost of travel up to the student, after that, no more. AMU will take care of the rest. <clears throat> Connectivity. I'm glad to announce that AMU is Wi-Fi connected. The walls are so thick in Sir Sayyid Hall that it was a problem for Wi-Fi connectivity, but we managed it. Tezubul Akhlaq is online. I wonder if you, you can read it online. You don't have to subscribe for it. Kennedy Hall is getting a video conferencing facility. So we'll be able to interact with alumni, students all over the world. It cost us 17.5 lakhs. American alumni met half and we paid the other half, balance. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you some, I want to give you some good news. AMU <coughs> nanotechnology is the best in the country. It's going to harness or going to lead, AMU is going to be the leader in the second green revolution of the country by harnessing nanotechnology. What have our scientists done? We have evolved nanotechnology processes by which we treated plants. They grew three times the normal size within a period of one month. It's so I saw it in front of my own eyes. We treated fruit and vegetables. Now, why we did, we did that is because um, 30% of the crops is eaten by stray cattle in India. 30% rots before it reaches the market because there's no refrigerated trucks and other things else. And what reaches the market is just 40% what is produced. So we treated fruit and vegetables and I'm glad to say that mangoes survive for 40 days without refrigeration, fresh as the day they were plucked. Tomatoes, 30 days. So if we can give this facility to farmers, it will change the whole. I mean, it will lead to the second green revolution of the country. Uh, we've submitted our papers. What we've not been able to check yet is whether it has any ad adverse effect on humans. But the scientists who have done this have been eating those mangoes for the last six months. <laughs> They look healthy enough. In fact, they've gained some weight. So I don't think it'll have any adverse effect on human beings. The next thing where we are going to be leaders is recycling wastewater. We have, in collaboration with the European Union, devised a method which is not energy intensive. Wastewater recycling is very, very expensive in energy costs. What is required is just huge troughs where special plants are cultivated. You release the wastewater into it. First is, uh, uh, you know, sedimentation. 
eight hours in that, three days in the trough, and out comes water, which is crystal clear. Not portable, certainly not. That require another stage, but good enough for irrigation, good enough for fish breeding. The plants grow very rapidly. They absorb all the nutrients which are in the water. So you get a whole lot of firewood. You can harvest those plants after two or three months. What is left in the sedimentation process is very rich manure. So you have your water. There's another stage involving UV, where if you want to drink that water, you can. So we are leaders in this. <clears throat> if we want to be the number one university of the country, we cannot compete with the IITs or the IIMs or the liberally funded medical institutions. But we are trying. Where we are going to concentrate on is our traditional departments. Yunani medicine, theology, West Asian studies, history, Arabic, Persian, Urdu. Urdu. That's something I missed when I was a child. Uh, I went to under care of Irish Christian brothers. I did know enough to write letters to my mother. That's it. But I'm correcting the whole thing. Urdu was taken as a laugh in AMU because its attendance was not counted. Its marks were not counted in your degree. So nobody came for Urdu classes. And I found our students reading Hindi newspapers. So I said, something's got to be done quickly. Despite all the resistance, we got it, pushed it through. Urdu attendance is now compulsory. Its marks are counted. So people have started reading Urdu newspapers. I myself am trying to learn Sher Shari. <laughs> That's something where I get an inferiority complex. I can quote the Charles of the Light Brigade and other uh, Lord Tennyson's poems, but Urdu's uh, Sher Shari is something which I intend learning. Pa. We already have a, an agreement with the government that we'll get uninterrupted power supply, but unfortunately, I'm paying 26 crores a year for that power. That means all non-planned budget of 30 crores is gone in electricity bills. What we are doing now is going to be, we're going to invest 20 crores in sun farms, you know, having these huge capacity generators will be far too expensive. Sun farms, to generate one megawatt, you need five acres of land and five crores. So we're going to invest 20 crores and 20 acres of land. We've got hundreds of acres of unproductive land under agriculture. They give us nothing in return. The cattle eat it up, the mollies, steal most of the produce. We are going to have an in and out meter. We will feed the grid from the sun farms. And then we will consume electricity. So whatever we feed in will be deducted. And we hope that with the four megawatts, our bills will be cut into half. That means from 26 or 25 crores, it will be reduced to 12.5 crores. So the 20 crores which, I, which we invest, we should recover it in two to three years. The rest, the life of those panels is 20 years. We are negotiating with several firms to do this. So we will have uninterrupted power and at reduced costs.
Let me also tell you something about madarsas. Much demonized all over the world. They are supposed to be the breeding ground of all sorts of nonsense. Totally incorrect. They are the biggest educational network in the country. I myself started my education in a madarsa. So I have love and attachment for these. <laughs> what are we doing about it? AMU admitted madarsa students to Arabic, theology, Persian. That's all. We have opened the doors of the university to all madarsa students who qualify in the written examination. Now, that's difficult. So last year, we conducted a bridge course for 50 madarsa students. Our view is that a madarsa student who's memorized the Quran would have a huge capacity to, to imbibe anything. We gave them a compressed course in English, computers, general knowledge. I'm glad to say, except for three, all these madarsa students have qualified for history, English honors, not only in AMU, but in Jamia Millia Islamia and Hamdard University. So it was a very successful experiment. This year, we are running a course of 65 students. We've taken 15 girls also, madarsa educated girls, and they are showing so much promise. When you visit, you'll you must interact with our madrasa students. We are calling it the bridge course. It's the bridge from Dini education to modern scientific education. The message it is sending to the madrasas is pressure of the students. They say, look, AMU is doing this for, for madrasa students. We want to qualify. For God's sake, change the syllabus. The teachers don't want to change it because they know nothing else. They only know deen. They don't know dunya. They'll have to change. The pressure from the students will be so overpowering. We tried to convince the mother sons to change. But they were very, very reluctant. They said, no, no, mother sons are only meant for deen, education. I said, no, it's meant for deen and dunya, both. Better change, otherwise we'll be left behind. So we are harnessing the power of the Madaris, and inshallah we will succeed. Having had the benefit of a good first-rate school education, the army did the rest. I educated myself, the army gave me opportunities, but I went with a senior Cambridge. I realized that I was so well equipped with my senior Cambridge certificate <coughs> to face anything. Uh, you can put anybody in front, at least I'll know what I'm talking about. What we lack is good schooling for our students. AMU is providing higher education. So we're making a start. We are starting off with establishing Sir Sayyid Public School at Muzaffar Nagar for the riot victims. We have got a, a donation of 12.5 bigas, that's almost four acres. And what we want to do is establish Sir Sayyid Public Schools across the country. We are starting off with Muzaffar Nagar because that was hit by riots. All institutions were destroyed. And that's what we, and this, the idea came up from the students themselves. They said, we won't have Sir Sayyid Day dinner last year. So we, the 51 lakhs which we would have spent on the dinner, we're gonna make a school. And when people heard that we have, AMU has contributed 51 lakhs, we got donations of 1.5 crores. So we got two crores in our pockets. We are going to make a first-rate school. First-rate. It will be better than the missionary schools. And, inshallah, if this project succeeds, 
there will be Sir Syed public schools all over. There is resistance to our forward movement. We are trying to run, not walk forward. When you move forward, even the air offers resistance. And we have a whole lot of resistance from some alumni, some teachers. The vast majority are behind us. But there is resistance, criticism, you would read it on the net, but we are not bothered. It doesn't affect us at all. We are pretty thick-skinned. Kirsten doesn't bother me or my team. We will cut through resistance. It will not hamper our progress forward, provided we have the blessings and the support of our alumni. My last word to you is what I've been saying everywhere. Your hundred will make a hundred percent difference to your alma mater. What do I mean by that? Whichever country you are in, if every alumni contributes hundred of the currency he's earning, just hundred. If you are in India, hundred rupees is good enough. If you are in America, hundred dollars. If you are in UK, hundred pounds. If thousands of alumni give us one hundred of theirs, it will make a hundred percent difference to your alma mater. I have noted the advice given. I have already answered some of the the things that are troubling you all. But let me give you one assurance. Inshallah, we will be number one university by 2017. If you've got any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Ah, before I forget, I'd like to present a small memento to the Alumni Association of UK. Would you please accept it? I will request Dr. Mohit Siddiqui, who is the senior most person here and an ex-president uh, of the association, to kindly receive it from the Honorable Vice-Chancellor on our behalf. And I would request Dr. Bidi Khan to please Sorry, join us. Please come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now is the time for you, ladies and gentlemen, to ask any questions. We are running short of time. I am very aware of that. So let us keep it to three questions. And please, one person can only ask in this short time one question now. Ask anything. Nothing embarrasses me. <laughs> can we make donations online to him? Yes. If you go on the AMU website, you'll get it. You can make donation. Please give your name, and uh, let me assure you, it will be acknowledged the next day. Okay. We want to ask something. Dr. Yeah. Fizer said, now is your time. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, I have a few questions. I probably will one go. question. Yeah. <laughs> I will probably will go to one question. Okay. <laughs> and my, it's not a question, basically a suggestion. My thinking is that AMU is struggling with income generation. With? Income generation. Yes. I think what you're trying to do is to reach out to the alumni and find out whether they can contribute, which is very good thing. But I think you also have to look internally how you can generate income. One of the way of generating, I have the exposure of working and living in the top institutions in the world. And what they are doing, particularly Oxford and MIT, they are generating their own income. One solution is to generate income within the NU. And that you can do by creating the science park. Whatever research you're doing, try to market it, exploit it, develop the companies. Which you, I had the liberty okay, to work Can I stop there, yes. please? You, you have conveyed what you want to say. Uh, Mr. Vashtian, do you yes. have to respond? Absolutely. You're absolutely right. I have already told you about the Dawa Khana. Yeah. We good, are trying to energize our farms. The moat around 
the fort, which has been dry since 1980, will be filled up with recycled water. We are generating thousands of liters of waste water, which is just being drained away. We are going to have fish farms. Most important is to stop the pillaging of the university. We ha I'll just tell you, Banaras Hindu University has got a corpus of 2,600 crores. Ours is not even 40 crores. And they are just a few months older than us. So we are trying to save as much. You know, a penny saved is a penny earned. We are trying to save whatever way we can. And that's why it's leading to a lot of criticism. People are finding, oh, I was used to so and so, and now I'm not getting it. You jolly well have to live. And you're not poorly paid. Our teachers are very well paid. I, thank you. We will. And the science park, we are already at it with the American alumni. There's a very good science park in Oxford. Yes. Try to, try to get there. Yes. Very good science park. Very good. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We are already at it. Right. Is there any uh, one last question? And if there isn't, then we will finish this session here. There isn't. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chancellor. I would say, "Dekhna takrir ki lazat ke jo usne kaha, maine ye jana ke goya ye bhi mere dil mein." Mr. Vice Chancellor, I can assure you that we are behind you. You you did mention about Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade, but I, listening to you, it's very clear that you have thought it through and your charge will be a different one, and it will be a positive one. And I assure you that we, alumni in UK, are with you. Thank you. And we will do our best to make your programs a success. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I ask now Nadeem Abbasi, our executive committee member, to come and deliver his vote of thanks. Honorable Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. It gives me great pleasure in proposing the vote of thanks for what has been a memorable evening for us. I would like to extend a special appreciation to our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Zamiruddin Shah, and Mrs. Shah for joining us this evening. General Shah has been, has been relentless in promoting service, quality, integrity, and sustainability over the last two years as the Vice Chancellor of a beloved alma mater. Honorable Vice Chancellor, on behalf of the Illegal Muslim University Alumni Association UK, I wish to express our gratitude to you for steering AMU through the new, often a tumultuous but exciting and challenging era in higher education. This has been achieved through your caring and people-centered leadership. I would also like to thank our guest speakers, Dr. Vaseem, for his passionate vision for AMU, and who, along with the Queen Mary University, helped us organize this event. Dr. Hilal Farid for his talk on Sir Sayyid AMU and us, and Mr. Feroz Mirza for your warm welcome address. And finally, my thanks to all of you for being here and being a wonderful audience. Thank you and good night.